Good morning. Um, thank you for tuning into this uh, week's episode of the e-lecture series, uh, MSK e-lecture series. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome our speaker today. We had uh, Dr. Diego Lemos giving a wonderful talk on uh, the acetabular labrum uh, last time, and he has graciously agreed to give a second talk, this one on glenohumeral joint instability. Um, Dr. Lemos is an excellent speaker who's recruited around the world to give uh, his phenomenal educational talks. We all really enjoyed them. The last one was fantastic. Um, he is the division chief of musculoskeletal imaging, the fellowship director at uh, the University of Vermont Medical Center. And uh, we are very delighted to, to have him speaking with us today. Um, and uh, at the end, if there are any questions that come up, um, you know, feel free to give him an email. He'll, he'll uh, show his email again, but his email is displayed here. So I don't want to take away too much of his time. So without further ado, I will defer to Dr. Lemos. Thank you, Adam. So uh, good morning or good afternoon or good night in other parts of the world. It is a pleasure to be back again with this awesome e-series organized by the MSK group at Emory. And they asked me to talk today about MR imaging of glenohumeral joint instability. I have a no disclosures and the objectives of the lecture is to develop a diagnostic approach when interpreting imaging studies in patients with glenohumeral joint instability to recognize the different types of instability that can affect the glenohumeral joint and to differentiate the spectrum of injuries that are associated with the different types of glenohumeral joint instability. The stability of the glenohumeral joint relies primarily on soft tissue restraints the osseous structures in contradistinction to the hip do not provide significant stability. And that has to do with the geometry of the glenohumeral joint. As you see, the, the glenoid fossa is not as deep as, as the acetabular fossa. And uh, the, the relationship between the size of the humeral head and the, and the glenoid fossa does provide the greatest mobility and range of motion of any joint in the body. But the paradox, as is that because the same reason is also the most unstable joint in the in the body. So for stability of the glenohumeral joint, we have dynamic and static stabilizers. Among the dynamic stabilizers, we have the rotator cuff apparatus, the long head of the bicep tendon, and the uh, scapular apparatus. And the rotator cuff apparatus does have an stabilizing effect on the glenohumeral joint because a compression, if you see the direction of the vector forces of the rotator cuff muscles, the, the balance net force is that one creating a compression uh, effect into the, into the joint. In addition, we also have a force coupling of the rotator cuff and the balance with the deltoid. If you see the direction of the delta, the vector of the deltoid, which is going up, in, in, in comparison with the balance net vector of the, of the rotator cuff tendon, which is going down, give you a, a, an equilibrium there. And these force couples of the glenohumeral joint occur both in the transverse plane as well as in the coronal plane. And in the transverse plane, the balance is between the, the forces of the anterior and the posterior rotator cuff, while on the coronal plane, the force coupling occurs between the deltoid and the rotator cuff, as I mentioned previously. The long, head, the long head of the biceps tendon also plays a minor role on stability of the glenohumeral joint by virtue of its origin in the superglenoid tubercle and its curves. As you can see, the relationship of the LHBT with the humeral head. So there, there is a role of the, of, the LH, of the long head biceps tendon. The scapular apparatus those have a role as well. And the effect is that the scapulothoracic motion or what they call the scapulothoracic rhythm is analogous. The best, the best analogy that you can think of is that of a seal balancing a, a small ball on, on the seal's nose. What happened is that at the glenoid, if you see in this movement from neutral to upward rotation, the glenoid moves like a seal uh, like the like a seal's nose to remain in the right spot to control and balance the the ball, which in this case is the the humeral head. So the normal scapulothoracic motion allows the scapula to rotate upward. You can see here how it's rotating upward. So the glenoid socket always remains underneath the humeral head. 
So again, this is very similar to a seal. You see when the when the seal moves it, uh, the body or the nose underneath that that ball. Now, if the if the scapulothoracic uh, motion, which is again up, upward upward rotation motion, is not normal and lags behind the the glenohumeral joint motion, which is mainly abduction in this case you will see that the socket is not going to be underneath at all range of motion underneath the humeral head, like in this upper panel, but it's going to lag behind. And what is going to result is on the humeral head pulling off the, the, the socket. So the ball will slip out of the seal's uh, nose. And this is a posterior view of the shoulder during abduction. Um, what you can see here is uh, shows the primary muscle interaction between the scapulothoracic uh, upward rotators and the glenohumeral uh, abductor muscles. So on this side are the scapulothoracic muscles with the upward rotation, and on this side the glenohumeral abduction. Uh, note, please, that there are here two separate uh, <coughs> two separate axes of rotation. The scapulothoracic axis is here is is, is located near the the carotid. Well, the glenohumeral axis is located in the in the humeral head. So, if you have less scapulothoracic upward rotation, or a significantly greater scapulohumeral rhythm radio ratio, what happens is that that will contribute uh, to glenohumeral joint instability, and again, the ball will fall of the seal's uh, uh, nose. So, in this in this particular case the balanced coupling will occur between those two muscle systems. Regarding the static stabilizers, we have the glenoid labrum, the capsule, the coracohumeral ligaments, and the glenohumeral ligaments. With there are several uh, most known are the superior, middle, and inferior glenohumeral ligaments, but there's also the so-called fasciculus oblicus or spiral glenohumeral ligament, and more recently described by Dr. Uh, Nicole Puyler from France is um, a posterior superior glenohumeral ligament. These ones are not as frequently seen as the superior, middle, or inferior uh, counterparts. So for the labrum, uh, I think that the best analogy that we can use is that one of a chart block, such as uh, here in this picture, where you can see the chart blocks uh, holding the in place the the tire of a small airplane, and that's what pretty much what the what the labrum does. Remember, the labrum is a ring of arachnoidinous tissue, and what it does is that it increases the depth of the otherwise um, shallow glenoid fossa by about fifty percent, and it also increases the contact area of this small uh, glenoid fossa with respect to the larger uh, humeral head. The capsule, as well as the coracohumeral ligaments, uh, in addition to the glenohumeral ligaments, as I mentioned previously, do play a significant uh, role in static stabilization of the glenohumeral joint. And you can appreciate here the normal curves of the superior, middle, and inferior glenohumeral ligaments, and then the spiral or oblique curves in a different uh, fashion of the fasciculus oblicus or the spiral glenohumeral ligament. <clears throat> the most important of the glenohumeral ligaments more definitely is the inferior glenohumeral ligament, particularly for the first part of this talk, the anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament. And the analogy that has been used the most is probably that one of a hammock. So the hammock uh, will be attached to the glenoid side and it will be attached to the humeral side. It has an anterior band a posterior band, and in between the two bands is the axillary recess. So here you can see the hammock-like anatomy of the inferior glenohumeral ligament, which allows for a reciprocal tightening of the anterior and posterior bands as the arm moves uh, from neutral here in A to external rotation and to internal rotation. You see on neutral, the inferior glenohumeral ligament complex is here lo located inferiorly, uh, holding like a hammock, the, the humeral head, and when it goes in external rotation, the glenohumeral uh, complex will move uh, anteriorly, while in internal rotation, it will move posteriorly. So depending on the arm position, the IHA, the inferior glenohumeral ligament complex will rotate to the front and back of the shoulder 
acting like a check rein against uh, this location. And as I mentioned previously, you, you have a humeral insertions of the anterior and posterior bands, as well as glenoid insertions of the anterior and posterior bands. And you can have failure of either of those anterior or posterior uh, insertion sites in the glenoid or in the humerus, and the resultant scenario will be a dislocation. The person will fall off the hammock. So that's about the dynamic and the static stabilizers. There are other factors that also contribute to glenohumeral joint stability, and those include the negative intraticular pressure by virtue of a vacuum effect of the joint, as well as the adhesion cohesion effect that you get when you have with a small amount of fluid within the joint. And that's in addition to the normal joint congruity because the geometry that we previously uh, discussed of the glenoid and the humeral head. And the version of the glenoid is a very important concept that we will uh, further discuss, particularly when we talk uh, towards the last half of the lecture about posterior and multidirectional instability. So perhaps the most uh, used uh, analogy for the glenohumeral journey is that one of a golf ball on a teacup. With the humeral head being the golf ball, and that golf ball, as you can see here in the diagram, is too large with respect to the teacup, which is the glenoid. So um, when you have instability, uh, particularly if you have a soft tissue or a banker fracture, uh, that phenomenon of instability is analogous to the golf ball falling of the fractured teeth. And uh, you can see here on an axillary view, the relationship indeed of a small uh, glenoid fossa with respect to the larger um, humeral head. And here is the fractured T and the golf ball falling off the cup. And that's what happened as you can appreciate here on the presence with the presence of a banker lesion. When we talk about uh, glenohumeral joint instability, we can classify by severity whether there is subluxation, if there is still some contact between the humeral head and glenoid, or if all this location, if there is no contact between the two osseous structures. The degree, uh, we have micro, MI, micro instability versus macro instability. And we will talk a couple of minutes about that. The direction of the instability, it can be unidirectional or it can be multidirectional, unidirectional, the anterior type is the most common with 95% of the cases, uh, followed by posterior about three uh, to 5%, and then inferior and superior directions uh, of this location are very rare. Multidirectional instability can be anterior inferior or posterior inferior. The chronology is another factor that we keep in mind when we talk about instability. It's different in acute versus a chronic uh, instability case, it's certainly different a first time dislocator versus a patient with recurrent subluxations or dislocation. And the imaging findings that you will see on each of these scenarios are different. The etiology of the dislocation or the instability can be traumatic or atraumatic. And there are several clinical categories. Now, if we talk about anterior joint dislocation, which again is the most common one, about 95% of the times there are four or five subtypes. The most common one by far is the subtracoid uh, variant. And then you have subglenoid, subclavicular, and trothoracic, and even retroperitoneal variants, which are very rare. For the posterior then homogeneous dislocation, the subacromial type is the most common, okay? The subglenoid and the spinous are, are rare. And as we mentioned previously, the superior and the inferior then homogeneous dislocations are quite uncommon. So here you have a nice diagram uh, from the literature about the, the main uh, subtypes of anterior dislocation, the subclavicoid, which again is the most common, followed by the subglenoid type and the subclavicular and the intrathoracic, which is pretty wild, as well as the retroperitoneal are less common. Here's a nice example of one of our cases on a patient with a classic subclavicoid uh, anterior dislocation, you can see how the humeral head is resting anteriorly and underneath the coracoid process. This is a subglenoid variant where the humeral head is uh, underneath the inferior osseous uh, glenoid rim. And this particular type of anterior dislocations are frequently associated uh, 
with this rate of fracture fragments from the from the greater tuberosity. I hear from the literature, this is very rare and I don't have cases of mine, but this is from the literature, a patient with an intrathoracic uh, fracture dislocation. You can see the, the fracture here and you don't see the cumul head, the patient is still on the trauma board and there are several rib fractures and you can see the contour of the humeral head, which is uh, dislocated intrathoracically. And here is the corresponding CT on that case. And things can become more wild. This is another example from the literature uh, on the patient. And you can see that uh, the, the dislocation was on the left side of the proximal humerus and several rib fractures, but there is a rounded density actually on the contralateral uh, right upper lung zone. And the patient has bilateral chest tubes. And uh, when you see the CT from that the case from the literature, you can see the pretty well path that the humeral head went through to end up on the, on the upper lung zone of the contralateral uh, lung field. And uh, believe it or not, this patient actually survived this trauma as this one did. You can imagine the, the severity of the, of the injury or the accident in this case, where you have a fracture dislocation and the humeral head ends up here in the retroperitoneum uh, lane adjacent to the to the left kidney, so pretty pretty well. And that was a case report from on JBAS in 1997. So that's uh, that. Now we usually don't put uh, patients with acute dislocations on the magnet. Sometimes patients will fall through the cracks and will show up in the magnet without saying that they had a dislocation. Or sometimes we do image patients if, for instance, they cannot reduce the dislocation in the in the ED, in the ER. And they want us to see if there is a soft tissue a structure that is interposed or a piece of bone that is precluding the concentric reduction of that joint. So right away here, you see that we are very interior. This is long head of the biceps tendon, coracoid, uh, AC joint, and you're already seeing the, the humeral head. And as we go from anterior to posterior, you see that and when you get to the glenoid, there is no humeral head because it's dislocated anteriorly. And you can see the severity and extensive uh, soft tissue injuries with rotator cuff tear, capsular tears, and ligamentous tears, and some of those are indeed interposed in the, in the joint. And you can see here on the axial images, the relationship of that anteriorly dislocated humeral head with respect to the glenoid fossa. So that happened uh, on an anti acute anterior case. And then for posterior joint dislocations, again, the subacromial is the most common type. And here case actually, I, I like this case a lot. This was during my fellowship. I was reading out the case with Dr. Resnick at UCSD. Uh, he got all excited with this case. As you can see that there is fixed internal rotation. They said chop uh, sign here. And there is, I don't know if you can appreciate it well, there is a lipohemarthrosis. So uh, here you can see probably better on this magnified view, the lipohemarthrosis. And you can see on the transescapular view that the isocenter of the humeral head is certainly uh, displaced posteriorly with respect to the center of the letter Y, the center of the scapula rather. And uh, this is a different case where uh, you can see the overlapping of the humeral head with the glenoid. You were not able to see the joint space and an attempt at Grashi. And the center of the humeral head is slightly displaced posteriorly with respect to the center of the of the scapular Y here, but not as, as, as overwhelming as what happened when they tried to do an axillary view. And just by gravity, you can see where the humeral head fell off the, the glenoid, so posteriorly. Um, I showed you a case of an acute anterior dislocation. Well, this is a patient that got in the magnet with a posterior dislocation. So this is the anatomy of the posterior cuff. This is infraspinatus and there is minor. And you can already see that the humeral head is dislocated posteriorly. It's not where it's supposed to be. And as I go anteriorly, you can see that there's a little bit of biceps tendon interposed, but you can see that the humeral head is not where it's supposed to be in relation with the glenoid fossa. And here on the axial and sagittal orthogonal planes, you can see that actually the humeral head is perched or locked against the, the inferior, the posterior margin of the glenoid precluding the normal uh, concentric reduction. So there you go, I show you a case of an anterior and a case of a posterior dislocation that, uh, that we got in the acute setting. 
superior glenohumeral joint. These locations are quite rare. This case, courtesy of Don Resnick, of a superior dislocation. You can see the, the X ray. This was post surgical. This is the T1, and this is the, the, the sensitive decoronal the stir. And the inferior glenohumeral joint dislocation, or the so called uh, luxatio erecta, is again very unusual. Probably a little bit more common than the superior dislocation, but still uh, quite uncommon. You can see here that the, um, the humeral head is dislocated inferiorly, and the axis of the humerus is completely abducted with respect to the axis of the scapula. So this is not an inferior or a sublenoid anterior dislocation. It's an inferior uh, dislocation because you can see the relationship of the axis of the humeral head with that of the scapular girdle. And you can see that the patient was unable to turn the palm uh, down. And these uh, patients with luxatio erecta have an increased incidence of neurovascular injuries, which can occur either at the time of the dislocation or with the reduction. So it's very important that the person in the ED or the orthopod knows to do the proper maneuver for reduction of a luxatio erecta. And this is the post-reduction uh, radiograph. And these patients with luxatio erecta or inferior dislocations have also these associated, commonly this associated fracture of the greater tuberosity as the subclinic type of anterior dislocation does. Uh, with respect to the clinical categories, we have two main groups of major instabilities and two minor instabilities. The major, the two major groups are the TOPS and EMBRI. TOPS is T-U-B-S and it stands for traumatic, U for unidirectional, B for banker, and usually these patients uh, require surgery. In contradistinction to AMBRI, A for atraumatic instead of traumatic, M for multidirectional instead of unidirectional, these patients can have bilateral shoulder instability and they can improve with rehab and inferior capsular shifting procedure. So you can think of uh, tops as torn loose, while Ambry is that you are born loose. And then the two minor groups of uh, instability are the AIOS, which is acquired instability on overstretched shoulder. This is a subtype of patients, usually athletes, that can develop this AIOS uh, minor subtype, or patients with MC, um, a traumatic minor shoulder instability. It's a group of patients with, with uh, joint laxity uh, similar to Ambry, but to a lesser extent. So it's certainly a spectrum uh, of, of instability going from traumatic to atraumatic, uh, from a single traumatic event to repetitive microtrauma. And when you're on the traumatic side, usually you have less laxity, and we're talking about unidirectional cases. Well, when you are on the other side of this, of this uh, spectrum with atraumatic uh, causes, you have more laxity, and usually these patients have more of a multidirectional rather than unidirectional instability, but it is a spectrum which with, with common sounds between the different uh, status here. Anterior uh, microinstability versus microinstability, just uh, uh, one minute to talk about it. I, I borrowed this image from Christine Chan's uh, nice article on AJR about slapters, just to use it as a as a guidance here, because if you use the, if you superimpose the tilted uh, clock face along the axis of the glenoid and you do the quadrant anatomy, you end up having four quadrants antero superior quadrant between 12 and 3, antero inferior quadrant between 3 and 6, posterior inferior quadrant between 6 and 9, and posterior superior quadrant between uh, 9 and 12. So the Main part of this talk is about anterior and inferior instability, which is between the three and six, okay? The last part of the talk is gonna be posterior instability. But this concept of microinstability actually has to do with pathology that occurs in the anterior superior quadrant between the 12 and the three o'clock position. And the pathology that occurs there has to do with the structures that we find in this quadrant. So that includes the anterior superior labrum, the middle and superior glenohumeral ligaments, the coracohumeral ligament, the bicipital pulley. So the pathology that you will see here is gonna be some types of slap tears and uh, bicipital pulley injuries. And this concept of microinstability is kind of uh, 
it's, it's a difficult concept, it's a difficult diagnosis to make clinically and on, on imaging in a lot of in a lot of times. The patient does not have macro instability. There is no clear uh, dislocation. What it is is that it, this arm is feeling in the in the shoulder that is loose, but it never really goes out all the way. So that's micro instability. But for this talk, we're going to be talking about anterior macro instability. Okay. And we have the classic anterior instability lesions. On the humeral head, you have the Helsax lesion. And on the glenoid side, you have Bankard and Bankard variants that we're gonna that we're gonna talk about. That's when the failure occurs on the glenoid side, but the failure can occur on the humeral side or on both sides. So we're gonna spend some time going through all of these injuries. Before we dig deep into the injuries, I just want to reinforce the concept, the circle stability concept, which was formulated by Dr. Warren back in 1984 to describe uh, pathomechanically the degree of tissue damage that is necessary for the glenohumeral joint to dislocate. So for a full dislocation to occur, both sides of the, of the circle, uh, that means uh, capsule, labral, ligaments, or bone must be injured. And the circle concept tells us that the depending on the direction of the stability of the dislocation, uh, if the humeral head dislocates anteriorly, the primary restraints are the anterior supporting structures, and the secondary restraints are the posterior uh, supporting structures. That's if the humeral head goes dislocates anteriorly. If it goes posteriorly, then this the may the primary restraint will be the posterior structures and the secondary restraint will be the anterior structures. But regardless, you will end up having failure, whether it's soft tissue or bony failure on both sides. Uh, and that's following that circle uh, theorem. And this is again uh, on an article from Dr. Uh, Holly Spotter and Dr. Warren out of HSS, uh, the Hospital for Special Surgery, uh, when they uh, talk to us about this uh, circle concept theorem again to help us understand the uh, pathophysiology here uh, for us to have a mental checklist or stretch pattern that should always look on one side and on the counter on the counter cup side to be sure that we're not missing an injury on the secondary restraints on, or on the opposite opposite side of the dislocation. So here you can see. And this is the original diagrams from Dr. Warren's paper back in back in the day in 1984. You can see that here the dislocation, the glenohumeral joint is, is anatomically aligned. And here, as the humeral head subluxes anteriorly, you have first a failure of the primary restraints in the anterior supporting structures. And when fully dislocates anteriorly, you also end up having some failure of the secondary restraints, in this particular case, the posterior supporting structures. And the opposite works for posterior dislocation. Here, in the, as the humeral head translates posteriorly with respect to the glenoid, you have first failure of the posterior uh, supporting the structures. And as it fully dislocates, you end up having some damage on the secondary restraint in the anterior uh, supporting the structures. So the glenoid failure is the most common one, occurs in about 70% of the cases. And the essential lesion is the banker. And then you have several banker variants, such as the ELPSA, which stands for anterior labral periosteal sleeve avulsion, Perthes, Olipsa, Gagel, which is glenoid avulsion of the glenohumeral ligaments, but with a normal labrum. So that occurs in about 70% of the cases. And about 20% of the cases, the failure can actually occur in the capsule itself. And then on 10% on of the cases, the failure can be on the humeral side. These uh, humeral lesions include the humeral avulsion of the glenohumeral ligament or Hegel, or the, which is a pure soft tissue avulsion, or sometimes it can be a bony Hegel when a piece of bone is avulsed at the humeral footprint of the glenohumeral ligament. And occasionally, rarely, the, the hammock will fail on both sides, at the humeral and at the glenoid insertion sites. And in that particular case, the anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament will be uh, floating. So I think that certainly glenoid failure is the most common. And I think that capsular and humeral failure, at least in my practice, are, are similar percentages, about uh, you know, 10 to 15% uh, uh, lines each.
other lesions that we can see in the setting of of glenohumeral joint instability. Some uh, some label there, particularly some slab lesions, such as the type five, the type five, which is like a type two with anterior extension below the level of the equator. So like a type two with a bankard or a banker variant. Um, a type seven, which is the type two that extends the tear extends into the MJ, into the middle glenohumeral ligament. Um, and a type nine, which is kind of a circumferential uh, label tear. So some of these slab lesions can be strongly associated with instability. And then some label cartilage injuries, such as the GLAD lesion, the glenoid label articular disruption, which was initially described not in the setting of instability, but we see more and more often a GLAD or GLAD-like lesions in patients with uh, dislocations that may develop subsequent instability. And then some GLAD variants, such as the most recently described GLAF, GLAF, or glenoid labral articular flap, when there's an associated flap, and then the GLAD lesion or glenoid labral articular tear job. And I will show you examples of all this, as well as the health sacs. So the banker lesion is when you have an avulsion of the anterior inferior capsule or labral ligamentous complex. It's a complete avulsion with periosteal disruption. It's completely uh, separated. And it comes in two flavors, soft tissue and bony bankers, and sometimes can look like a mass. So let me show you some examples. So here's a beautiful um, illustration from Matt Skalski. Matt is a terrific uh, MSK radiologist and artist. So he provided uh, the majority of the illustrations on this talk. And you can see that in this case, there is complete detachment of the anterior inferior capsulolabral ligamentous complex. So this is a soft tissue banker, and it is the essential lesion in this type of instability. Here on axial image, axial T1 weighted images of an MR arthrogram with contrast in the joint, you can see complete detachment of the anterior inferior labrum. And you can see that the periosteum was straight, but it's also disrupted. And as I continue going inferiorly, the whole thing is detached. Another case here where you can see complete detachment of the anterior inferior labrum as it remains completely separated from the anterior inferior glenoid ring. Uh, here you have an example with, with uh, T1 non fat sat and a T2 fat sat uh, showing complete detachment of soft tissue uh, banker. And this is uh, the appearance of banker and barker variants on a particular provocative uh, position that we like to do on MR arthrography, particularly. Sometimes we will do it in routine MRI if we have beforehand the history of instability. But here you can see this is called the ABER position. A, B, E, R for A, B, duction, external rotation. And in this particular case, you put tension on the anterior band of the anterior glenohumeral ligament, which lifts the, uh, lift, lifts the labrum, the anterior inferior labrum, and allows the undercutting of fluid or contrast and makes the injury better or easily seen. And in this particular case, you can see that the labrum is completely detached from the glenoid, as it is in this case. And this is a more chronic uh, banker with a large uh, heel size. So this is on ABER, and this is how you position the patient uh, for ABER with the arm in uh, flexion, uh, abduction and external rotation, and under behind the head. And this is where you put the, the flex coil. And this is how you do the planning for the imaging acquisition with images that you acquire the images about 45 degrees with respect to the long axis of the, of the glenoid. And this is an article where you can, uh, where I got these images from. Uh, the title of the article is the added value of a position for detection and classification of the anterior inferior labral ligamentous injuries with MR photography of the shoulder. That was on uh, European radiology. So sometimes it can look like, a, like an ovoid mass, uh, that banker lesion. And when that's the case, you can certainly, some people use the acronym GLOM. GLOM for glenoid labrum, ovoid mass, such as in this case that you can see the, the hill sex lesion. So we are high in the joint and you have these mass like structures. So there is a differential for a finding like this. And that includes, for instance, um, um, an intraarticular dislocated long head biceps tendon. So whenever you see something like this, go and be sure that you don't have an empty. 
by Cypriot group that actually the LHBT is well positioned uh, within the within the Bicipro group. Uh, the other differential is an interarticular body, um, as well as, for instance, uh, a variant like a Buford complex. You can have conceivably an MDA, a middle and a human ligament that is very thick, like curved, like looking almost like this, and then you have an absent anterosuperior labrum. So in these particular cases, I check my biceps that it's okay, and then I run my entire labrum to be sure that the anterosuperior labrum is present. So I'm not dealing with a Buford if the, if this turns out to be the thick and MDA shell. And I certainly go anterior inferiorly to be sure that there is no banker lesion and that this actually corresponds to the banker uh, lesion that is displayed uh, superiorly. And here you have another example of a glum case with the hill sex lesion and the labrum, the anterior inferior labrum, being displaced here and looking indeed like an ovoid mass. And one more with the hill sex lesion here. And as I go to the joint, I have two almost ovoid looking masses here. So you cannot have two glums. So the, in the, this is one glum and something else. So I go to my checklist and I find out that the biceps, uh, that the bicipital group is empty. So one of these two probably is the intraticularly dislocated long head biceps tendon. And when I do the cross correlation tool on packs, you can see that these uh, more anteriorly uh, located uh, ovoid mass is actually the intraticularly dislocated long head biceps tendon. Well, this one uh, corresponds to the torn uh, anterior inferior capsular labral ligamentous complex, which looks like an ovoid mass in this case. And uh, another beautiful diagram from, from Matt, from Dr. Skalski, showing not only the soft tissue, but the bony variant of a banker lesion. So the difference is that with the bony banker, you have a fracture of the anterior inferior glenoid rim. This is a pure soft tissue injury, and this has a bony component. And here, case in point, an old uh, an axial uh, gradient echo image uh, showing the, the banker fracture. And here uh, on a coronal plane, you can see another banker fracture. And uh, this is this uh, nice case is courtesy of Roar Peterson. Uh, Roar is uh, an MSK, a great MSK radiologist from Norway. And he graciously lent me this, uh, this case of an skeletally mature girl that was skin, ice skating on, and fell and uh, dislocated her shoulder anteriorly. So you can see here a rather shallow hill sex lesion, but a bony vanguard with a fracture of the anterior glenoid rim. I suggest, I recommend that you follow uh, Dr. Peterson on his Instagram account, which is MSK Radiology Now for Norway. Uh, he, po he posts very often great, great MSK cases. So if you have a chance, uh, Follow him because he has uh, he has great cases to share. And this is the sagittal image of the same case showing the the bony banker. And the CT we use in these cases as well, particularly for a more accurate quantification of the of the percentage of bone loss and the uh, size of the of the banker fracture fragment and the degree of comminution. And we can do 3D reconstructions that the orthopods certainly appreciate. And they like it for the concept of inverted pair morphology. You can see here the soft tissue uh, banker with a bony banker, and like somebody took a bite of that normal uh, pear shape, which now with the with the bite ends up having like an inverted pair morphology. And these are diagrams from Scottish book uh, done by Salvador Beltran, which is another amazing uh, illustrator. So. That's the, the concept of the, of the inverted pair uh, glenoid that was proposed by, by Dr. Stephen Barnhart uh, several years ago now. So here we have a case of a bony, quite sizable bony banker on axial and the two coronal images. And as I scroll on the coronal plane and go towards the lesion, you can see the severity of the soft tissue injury and then the, all the fragments that were shred off the the anterior inferior glenoid rim, and this is the CT correlation. And there was a little bit of comminution, not that much. This is the 3D reconstruction showing the anterior inferior displacement of the, of the banker fracture fragment. 
Here, another case, this one on a patient that already had uh, a stabilization procedure, a banker repair, but dislocated again. And you can see the, the very big uh, bony banker with a piece of bone and cartilage from the glenoid uh, is displaced and is comminuted. You can see there the suture cracks from the prior uh, banker repair and the displacement of the injury. And you can see here the degree of comminution, which is certainly more than the prior than the prior case. And all these have prognostic implications. And this case of another banker, you can see here a, a medialized and deep uh, Kelsax uh, lesion in the posterior supralateral aspect of the humeral head. And as I go on the coronal plane, you can see all this big mass gumbo of tissue that is displaced anterointermedially. So almost like an ulcer, like a chronic ulcer, but these had pieces of bone because there was, and you can see the pieces of bone there because it had a associated uh, bony bank that lesion and it was displaced and scared down anterointermedially in that aberrant uh, position. So you can see it there on the, on the axial images, that big mass there with uh, pieces of, of bone and that's the, the 3D reconstruction to show the hill sex lesion. And it's good, the 3D CTs are good also to talk about the on-track, off-track uh, theory of the hill sex lesion, which we will discuss later on. This case is a bony, it's a banker lesion, but this is a common scenario that we see is patients that come with a routine study, not an arthrogram. So you see already the, the health sex lesion in the posture supralateral aspect of the humeral head. And we just have to become better at diagnosing these, these things. If you see the anterior and the posterior labrum, they look okay above the level of the equator and above the level of the equator. But when you cross inferiorly, you can see the, the sudden change in the morphology and signal intensity of that labrum, which is now more irregular, more gray, and it starts to be detached from the glenoid rim. And this is all abnormal and actually quite extensive injury. If you see, it's just more difficult to appreciate because there is no joint effusion. So there is no like natural orthogram because of hemophrosis. And there's certainly no contrast in the joint. So you can see here the detachment of the periosteum as well. So it's a very extensive banker lesion that if you go very fast, you may you may fly through if you don't pick up on the hill sex lesion either. So uh, here on the coronal plane, you can see all this is very abnormal. And because it's a subacute injury or, or more chronic injury, you don't have a lot of soft tissue edema either uh, or an effusion. So that's the, that's the problem and that makes things a little bit more difficult. So you may think that you are dealing with with an adhesive capsulated case or just sequela from a prior stretching injury, but it was actually quite extensive uh, banker or banker variant uh, lesion. And again, you see your small residual bone meridima from the hill sacs. So in this particular case, and that's the hill sacs, uh, because I was actually looking at the case as the images were getting done, I called the tech and asked her to please give me an additional sequence on Aber. So you can see how close the hill sacs lesion comes to engage into the anterior glenoid. So this is abduction external rotation. And you can see very nicely the detached labrum and the striped uh, periosteum. So that's uh, how we diagnose it in this particular case. On the routine non-provocative MR images in the routine orthogonal planes, as well as on the uh, provocative ABER uh, sequence that was obtained. This same patient uh, ended up having a CT because recurrent instability, and you can see that there was indeed a sleeve, a small sleeve of periosteum that was completely detached. Now, for for uh, assessment of the percentage of bone loss, there are different methods that you can use. Uh, there's this paper now from 10 years old or so from JBAS about uh, recurrent shoulder instability and the evaluation and management of glenoid bone loss. So they use different methods or they teach us different methods. And certainly if you have the software from your CT to do this uh, surface area with the calipers, you can do that. And uh, A will be the, the true fit circle surface area of the glenoid. And B will be the surface area of the osseous fragment as you do the, the tracking with your, with your calipers. 
And using that formula, you will be able to uh, determine the percentage of bone loss. If you don't have that software, then there are other things that you can do. This is certainly too complicated for me to even get into with this calculation. Uh, you can also measure, by the way, the length of the osseous defect. And if the fracture fragment, rather the length of the fracture fragment is greater than the ratio of the, of the truffid circle, then that means that the, the dislocation resistance is less than 70% of a normal joint. So the size of the fracture fragment is also important. But this is actually the method that I use because I find it more easy and more reproducible for me. So what I do is a truffid circle at the center of the circle, which is an approximation to the bare area of the glenoid is the center of the circle. And I go from the center to the back. So that's B and from the center to the anterior edge of the glenoid where the fracture occur and that's A. So if you do B minus A over two times B, that will give you your percentage of bone loss. And that's what I, what I use, that's what we did in this case. And it was less than less than 10, it was like 7% on this particular case. Now, depending on this same article, they give us this nice algorithm that depending on the percentage of bone loss, you do the treatment. So it's quite important for the orthopedic surgeons to have an accurate estimation of that percentage of bone loss. Here you have another banker variant where you can see that here in the back, we have this big gumbo of displaced tissue with fragments of bone. And you can see that it is entering to a medialized. And here on this very nice aber with and without fat sat on the MR arthrogram, you can see the complete detached anterior inferior capsule labral ligamentous complex with the pieces of bone from the associated uh, bony banker. So and here on the sagittal images. So that's uh, that ALSA is anterior labral periosteal or labral ligamentous periosteal slip avulsion. The periosteum is stripped, it is elevated, but it's not disrupted in contradistinction to the, to the banker lesion. There's not complete detachment. And you can have acute or chronic ulcers or, or, or non-displaced versus displaced ulcers. So let me show you some examples. A beautiful diagram from, the, from Matt showing um, a little bit displaced, but it's still acute ulcer lesion. The labrum still holds its normal morphology but you can see the stripping of the periosteum and there are varying degrees of displacement. This can be certainly be more closely opposed against the glenoid, it can be mid-side or it can be this separated, but still the strip uh, periosteum is attached to the scapular neck. And here you have case in point where there is a stripping of that anterior periosteum and not that much displacement. Here, a little bit more displacement uh, but the periosteum, which is a strip, is, is still attached here to the, to the glenoid. This one is on a routine MR on our 3T magnet, and you can see that there is a very thin uh, strip uh, periosteum that is still attached, so it's not that uh, displayed. Some people may call this actually a perthes lesion, but I just call it uh, a non-displaced ulcer when the component of periosteum is stripping is more than what we, would, would I expect for a, for a parathesis. But pretty much a non-displaced alopsa and a parathesis lesions can be very similar. The difference is that the parathesis, you may actually completely miss it on the axial images and only see it on Avers. I'll show you some examples. Here you have another, uh, not that much of displacement of an alopsa lesion. It's slightly more chronic. You can see that the everything is now like starting to look more thick and uh, but not that much displacement here inferiorly. And here now you can see the same phenomenon, but with Aber of, of, of an ulcer that is not that much displaced and still attached here with the periosteum. And this is what can happen over time, you know, it can become more chronic and then you have like this mass of scar tissue that is, that is, um, that is scarred down into the anteroinflammedial anterior glenoid with a thick uh, capsule and a thick uh, glenohumeral ligament and a thick periosteum. And it doesn't have a more normal appearance of a labrum anymore. So it's like a bulbous um, big mass scar down there for a chronic displaced ulcer. And let me show you some examples here on Aber, you have an ulcer that is more separated than some of the examples that I showed you previously, but not that bulbous, this one, 
certainly looks like a big gumbo here and it's not a more normal label looking uh, anymore. And you can see that it's entering to a medialized and you can see here on Aber what it is. So it's certainly different than the case that I just showed you. And on the coronal images, you can see that the whole thing is no longer where it's supposed to be, but it's entering to a medialized uh, there. Here you have another nice case on the axial T1 non fat sat and T2 fat sat of an arthrogram. We like to do a T1 non fat sat on our arthrograms to help us with the bone loss and with the anatomy. Uh, but that, you know, that varies from place to place. And uh, here you have the, the, the chronic ulcer in the coronal plane and the hill sex lesion. And this is on, on, on Aber. You can see where the mass is scarred down here and during from medially on the glenoid, not where it's supposed to be any longer. So that's that. And this is like a tongue-like chronic uh, ulcer. With, with a broad base by shallow gold sacs lesion. A perthes, as I mentioned previously, is a very, is a, is, is a more subtle injury. There may or may not be a little bit of a stripping of the periosteum, but not as much as on an ulcer and not as much displacement either. So you may pick it up sometimes on actual images, like in this case, you may have a hint that there is something going on there, but difficult to make the call just with that image. And when you go to a abduction external rotation with tension plates on that anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament, you lift that uh, anterior inferior labrum and allow the penetration of some contrast to make the detection of the lesion uh, more easy. Uh, look at this case. You have uh, a, a little tear here along the condolable junction anterior inferior lead. You see it on two axial images, and that's it. Normal there, one and two. And, and that's it, not that much displacement or anything, but when you put the patient in Aber and, and you have there to, to compare on the same patient, you start seeing your, your, your lesion in one, two, three, four consecutive slices. So it gives you a better sense of the extent of the injury as you put tension on that anterior inferior label from the taut anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament, okay? Look at this case. This case actually Aber saved us because even retrospectively, we went back and looked at the anterior inferior labrum and you cannot see anything, not even a, a drop, a minimal inhibition of contrast on any of the images on the anterior inferior labrum. So it, it, it looks like a normal labrum, but when you go in Aber, you can actually see that normal there, one and two. That was it only on two slices, consecutive slices on Aber, we were able to see this uh, otherwise extremely subtle perthes lesion. So the Aber saved us in this particular case on this patient with indeed had instability. These drawings I use with permission of Dr. Amami from, from Trans Patrick uh, Gracious. They let me use them just to show again the comparison between a perthes and a non displaced obsa or an acute obsa. A perthes may not have any periosteal stripping at all, and the labor may not be that displaced, uh, such as in this case. We see it because we put the patient on, 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 on Aber, but otherwise it will be more difficult to appreciate. And that's different than this solution that you can see here, and it's fairly different than this. So, so Aber can be useful in this particular setting. Look at this case. Is this an ulcer? Is this a perthes? Is this a banker? Sometimes the lesions look different at different levels. So here you have a nice heel sac, and you see that the anterior superior labrum is completely detached. Detached here, and the, the periosteum is detached. But as you continue going close to the close to the to the equator, still detachment of the of the anterior labrum. And as you go anterior inferiorly, you start seeing this, which is nothing more than a slit of strip periosteum that is, is still attached uh, to the glenoid. So it looks like a non-displaced non ulcer or a perthes, if you will, there now more inferiorly here looks like a chronic ulcer. So in this particular case, the patient uh, let us do an either that's adduction internal rotation, which is a good alternative uh, provocative sequence to use when the patients uh, cannot do ABER either because uh, fear of dislocation or, or pain or impingement. So they don't want to do ABER. So you can do either 
adduction internal rotation with the arm behind the back. And that what it does is shifts the contrast from the from the posterior uh, joint into the anterior joint, and you can see these lesions uh, better. So it's kind of a Pursman Aber, if, if you wish. So you can see here the internal rotation, here's the rotation of the hill sacs with respect to here. And then you can see that you can see certainly better the stripping of the periosteum now with some contrast penetrating underneath by virtue of the positioning on either. And this is different than the position that we do with Aber, as I showed you previously. This one, the patient don't put the arm uh, behind, up and behind the head. This one goes behind the back. So similar to Napoleon's uh, position now. Napoleon's is more well known for the position of his anterior arm underneath the, the tuck here underneath the shirt. But the posterior arm is what I'm referring to uh, here in this diagram from Napoleon moving from the back. So that's how you do either. And this is a nice article on the Journal of MRI from 2006, uh, where this group uh, talked to us about on an original research paper about the ADER position, again, adduction internal rotation for evaluation on MR arthrography of, of lesions in patients with anterior inferior uh, instability. So that's how, uh, that's how I look in this case. But this patient was able to do ABER as well, very collaborative patient. And this is how this patient did have a little, uh, uh, you know, peel back a posterior superior label tear here, but you can see the entire tearing of the anterior label here going anterior inferiorly in this particular case, okay? And that's the CT showing the strip uh, sleeve of periosteum and the 3D reconstruction. So I show you, uh, Perthes lesions, which are non displaced and very subtle, versus a slightly more displaced acute abscess, versus displaced chronic abscess, and complete the, all these are with a uh, strip or intact periosteum, versus lesions with disruption of the periosteum, which are the bank cards, whether it's a soft tissue or a bony variant. So, again, this is uh, with permission of, of, of Patrick and uh, the diagrams on this. I showed you several of these cases already just on Avers, so you can compare an aperthes with a little bit of separation, uh, an acute obsa with the stripping of the periosteum, but still some normal morphology, a chronic obsa with a bulbous scar down anterior inferior capsular labral ligamentous complex in this position, and then a soft tissue and bony banker completely detached from the glenoid ring. Ellipsa is when you have an anterior ligamentous periosteal sleep avulsion, is uh, not sure if it's a developmental or a true lesion. Uh, some researchers believe that it's a true lesion, probably related to a peelback phenomenon, and probably a precursor of a gagal lesion. So this is the diagram from Matt Skalski for an ellipsa. It's just a stripping of the periosteum and the ligament, the capsule, but the labrum is intact. So two cases courtesy of Don Resnick from UCSD. Here you see the capsule that is stripped. It's supposed to come here, but it's not, but the labrum is intact. And here, another case with an, anterior, an intact anterior inferior labrum, but a little bit of a stripping of that uh, anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament and capsule that still is attaching to the glenoid. That's the sagittal. So that's different, or this is the big brother of the ellipse, it's gagel, is complete soft tissue avulsion of the glenohumeral ligament. But again, the anterior inferior labrum is intact. And this gagel lesion, similar to the ulcers and, um, and the bankers, can be acute or chronic, partial or complete, and can be pure soft tissue or rarely have a little bony avulsion at the footprint of the glenohumeral ligament in the glenoid. So here is an example. You see that there at the glenoid insertion with a normal labrum. And this is a case that retrospectively was a gaggle, but actually I call it a banker because I thought that the labrum was slightly abnormal and it was partially pulled in there. But when, Nate, uh, when the orthopedic surgeon went in and, and repaired the lesion, he told me that everything was just fibrosis and granulation tissue from the capsule, that it was detached from the glenoid 
but the labrum, the anterior labrum was actually intact. So no, it was a gagel. Now I have this subacute gagel, courtesy of Daniel Aminse, um, who graciously let me use it. Nice inferior glenohumeral ligament. The humeral insertion is intact, but the glenoid insertion is at the point of failure and the labrum was normal. So this was acute or subacute. You can see all the soft tissue edema still, uh, glenoid avulsion of the glenohumeral ligament without involvement of the labrum. And this last case for Gagel, courtesy of Hillary Humans from New York. I love this case that Hillary uh, graciously let me use for educational purposes at this lecture because he shows very nicely the glenoid avulsion of the inferior glenohumeral ligament and capsule, but the labrum is intact. The anterior labrum is intact. You have here the some bone marrow edema from the Hellsax lesion, which you can certainly appreciate better on your sagittal. And here on this uh, sagittal at the glenoid level, you can see the stripping of the anterior capsule and anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament, but the humeral insertion was intact. And what I love about this case, and you can see that's only on the axial images, on the straight axial images, you can see that the labrum is intact and the injury was just the capsule and the glenohumeral ligament at the glenoid insertion site. This is on the straight axials, but they do over there at Lennox here at, at Hillary's place, they do this so-called BLO uh, sequence, the biceps label oblique. So if you see the planning of the image is very similar to the planning that I show you for the Aber. So these images look like Aberish, but you don't have to reposition the patient. The patient stays, stays in the same position. Now, that granted, there is no tension placed in the anterior body of the inferior glenohumeral ligament, but they do look Aberish. And in this particular blow, BLO images, you can see the complete soft tissue avulsion of the anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament and capsule with a normal looking label. So true gagel lesion, courtesy of Dr. Humans. This was a chronic gagel from, from our institution. You can see the abnormal leakage of contrast uh, following the glenoid. So we knew that it was going to be some sort of glenoid failure on the arthrogram, on the fluoral images. I don't remember if I saved some images uh, here, but the contrast was leaking on this direction, which is abnormal. And as we scroll through the case, the anterior labrum, the anterior labrum is intact, but there is this round area, which was a fibrotic scar uh, glenoid avulsion of the glenohumeral ligament that uh, we saw here on the on the coronal images. You see the Hellsax lesion. And here on the, oh yeah, these are the floral images. You can see that very early on in the injection, we were in the joint and just start having this abnormal pattern of contrast going, going, um, going medially along the glenoid, which is suggestive of an injury or failure on the glenoid side in contradistinction to contrast leaking along the cortex of the humerus for an injury failure at the humeral insertion site or the leaking into the middle of the axillary pouch for mid-capsular tears. So this was suspected already on the arthroscopic images. This is all abnormal and it was uh, on the arthrographic images and it was corroborated uh, certainly on the MRI here on the axial images. You can see that the anterior inferior labrum was intact. And as you get here inferiorly, that's where that big mass appeared. And that was the the, the scarred uh, gagel lesion still with a little defect allowing contrast to leak out there since it was not completely attached to the to the glenoid. So by definition, a gagel and a chronic gagel, if you will, in this case, and the corroboration of the axial, coronal, and sagittal planes. And this one was a bony gagel. Also the labrum, again, was intact. Some bone marrow edema from the whole sex lesion. And here you can see this uh, indistinctness of the black particle line along the, the, the scapular neck and glenoid is there. And here you can see the little piece of bone uh, pulled from that uh, insert, glenoid insertion site of the inferior glenohumeral ligament. But again, the anterior inferior labrum intact, okay? And this is certainly different than this, which is a, a banker lesion. 
with the labrum abnormal because it's here. So normal labrum capsule, abnormal labrum with the entire anterior inferior capsule, or labral ligamentous complex being displaced there. As you can see here, no labrum. Labrum is here, completely detached, different than this, okay? So that's how you can see it. And this one, certainly the bony gagel. Capsular failure, uh, these are mid-capsular uh, intersubstance uh, rents or tears. And this is the diagram from Dot Skalski. And you can see that the glenoid insertion is intact. The humeral insertion is intact, but the defect is in the middle of the hammock in the axillary pouch, a mid-capsular tear, the hill sac lesion, and then the beautiful representation of that uh, mid-capsular tear. And uh, here you have another case with a fracture of the greater tuberosity. The humeral insertion is fine. The glenoid insertion is fine, but the tear is occurring in the middle of the, of the hammock. So sometimes it can be difficult to differentiate between these, as you can see. And to finish that part, then the humeral evolutions of the glenohumeral ligament. So that's the Hegel lesion. So they can come into flavor, soft tissue and bony, when there is a fracture, instead of saying Hegel, we see it bony Hegel or B Hegel, and the contrast is leaking along the, the, the cortex of the proximal humerus. And here you have a case in point, beautiful associated fracture of the greater tuberosity, as we often see on these patients with Hegel that tend to occur in a little bit older than on the banker ones. The patients that have failure on the glenoid side are usually in their uh, late 20s or 30s. Patients with Hegel's can be in their early 40s or later, and they are associated with these greater tuberosity fractures and rotator cuff tears, particularly the subscap. So always take a look on that when you're dealing with, with, a, with a Hegel. And here you have the PD. This was a natural artogram, the joint effusion and hematrosis. So this is a PD non fat sat and a P2 fat sat, and you can see that the, there is no more normal U shaped morphology of the axillary research, but this is like a J or an inverted J, if you, if you will, with a thickened uh, edge here of the torn inferior glenohumeral ligament that fell at the humeral insertion site. And that's your, your, your greater tuberosity fracture. So it went all the way from anterior to posterior. And this patient initially had a subglenoid type of anterior uh, shoulder dislocation, and that's the greater tuberosity fracture. This one was one of our uh, athletes, UVM athletes, one of the varsity players from the football, from the UVM football uh, team. He got tackled and dislocated uh, his shoulder. And uh, even though he's a skeletally immature, he had a Hegel instead of a, a glenoid failure. He had failure at the humeral insertion side, still a little bit of a residual effusion. So not all patients read the book. You can have Hegel lesions in in young patients, uh, case in point uh, here on one of our varsity athletes. This one, a little bit more uh, complex, uh, Hegel, partial in some areas, complete as you go more posteriorly, also associated with a tuberosity fracture and a subscapular stare in this case. And this is more of a chronic Hegel. You see that the torn ligament now looks like a, like a ball here. So it's like an ulcer, but not a glenoid failure. It's a humeral failure, you know, like a chronic ulcer. So here you have one that is completely detached. And here you have one that healed in uh, near its normal footprint, but still a residual lump in there. So these are chronic uh, Hegel's, and that's different than the chronic ulcer that I was showing you before. But chronicity means that there is loss of the normal morphology of the structure that is torn and now look, has fibrosis and granulation tissue and looks more like a ball in there, okay? There is this nice article uh, published on AJR last year about, um, from, from the UCSD group, actually the diagram, the illustrations are courtesy of, of Brady and Eric, uh, Dr. Uh, see, Dr. Huang and Dr. Chang who are, who are attendings on the on the on the MSK division at UCSD, and they did these very nice uh, diagrams to show us different Hegel uh, lesions. This one, when it's a single thin fascicle, as one of the ones that I show you. This one, when there's a little bit of thickening and fibrillation on the on the end of the torn ligament, like I showed you on that varsity athlete. 
uh, the football player, or when you start having more of a slightly thickened and tapered, re, uh, tapered uh, ligament, or a reverse tapered uh, ligament, or certainly a scar one like this one. So any of these morphologies can help you to differentiate between a true uh, lesion, a Hegel lesion, and the appearance that you can see with iatrogenic extravasation of contrast where you will not have any of these nor abnormal uh, morphologies, okay? So that's a nice article on AJR last year if you wanna read it. Bony Hegel lesions, more unusual, this case from Dr. Resnick's archives when we digitalized all his hard copies uh, 10 years now or so. Uh, courtesy of him, this is kind of a chronic, uh, chronic Hegel, B. Hegel, you can see on uh, Dr. Skalski's diagram that there's a piece of bone that is pulled from the footprint. And here you can see that there is a fat containing osseous fragment and that's the radiograph correlation. But this is more of an acute case from Don that shows the piece of bone that is able from the, from the glenoid, that your hill sacs lesion. And here you can see the, the bony fragment and the donor site at the insertion of the anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament. I uh, hear the 3D reconstructions show the donor site and the fracture, and the MRI showing nicely the fragment, the associated pair of the subscapularis and the detachment of the, of the glenohumeral ligament. So a B. Hegel. This one is a more chronic B. Hegel. You can see that there is almost now like an exostosis at the footprint of the, uh, its humeral insertion and looks now like a mass. And this is really a chronic B. Hegel. It was actually uh, a large avulsion of the lesser tuberosity that involved the footprint of the subscapularis as well as the, super, as the footprint of the, of the IDHL. So you can see it here, a very chronic case. And particularly on, on Aber, you can see the anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament inserting upon that uh, residual deformity from a large uh, fracture. And you can see on the 3D reconstruction, the fragments along the path of the inferior anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament. So that's a very chronic case. And then you can have failure at the humeral and glenoid insertion site. So the floating inferior glenohumeral ligament as Matt is showing us here on this, on this diagram. And you can see that in our case, it's complete failure at the humeral and glenoid insertion. So you can see here on the PD and on the T2 fat sats, how the whole hammock is detached on both sides. So it's floating in there in the axillary recess. And you can appreciate that as well very nicely here on the axial images with complete failure at the glenoid and humeral insertion sites. So I show you to, uh, to finish this part of the lecture injuries on the glenoid side, evolution of the inferior glenohumeral ligament at the glenoid side, evolution of the glenohumeral ligament at the humeral side, soft tissue and bony, and then evolution at both sides with a floating anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament and then the mid capsular tears, okay? Uh, glad lesions, uh, this is a full thickness fissure with condylable uh, delamination. And this is a patient with a dislocation. Here you have another one. You can appreciate on Matt Skalski diagram, the lesion that correlates very well with the MR case. And here you have again, the fissure along the condylable junction, a little component of the lamination. So another, another GLAD lesion on a patient with a, with a hill sacs. Here you have this one more subtle initially, but then, with this large component of basal or chondral delamination, you end up having this uh, flap that it was non displaced. And when you have flaps that are displaced, then you can start using terms such as slab or glat. Uh, so let me show you a couple of examples of that. So here, again, a heel sex lesion. And when, as you go here, you see that there's nothing here. And then, boop, a little, a little flap, just a slightly flipped. That's it, nothing there, and just that and your hill sex lesion. Another case, you see a little fissure there, but nothing, no flap, and then nothing, and then boop, a little tongue protrusion there. That's a tiny flap that is just flipped, but not that much displaced. So in those cases, I use the term GLA, glenoid label articular flap. Sometimes can be label tissue, sometimes can be chondral tissue. In my experience, the majority of them are actually chondral tissue. 
the labrum is okay, but they can, it can vary. So here's the bone marrow edema from the heel sex. Uh, that's your heel sex lesion. And let me show you now real glad lesions, glenoid articular teardrop. The analogy is that the flap will fall off into the axillary recess like a teardrop. So here you have the donor side, and then you start seeing this pedicle and look at the size of the flap coming into the axillary recess. And sometimes they can be very big. This is the donor side. This is another patient and look with the classic Carlash signature of this GLAD lesion uh, flipping into the axillary recess. And one more here anteriorly, nice pedicle and the, and the teardrop falling into the axillary recess there. This case is courtesy of Benoit Reis. He's from Switzerland, a great MSK radiologist. I strongly recommend that you follow him on Twitter. This is his handle because he very often posts extremely nice cases. And he let me use this case for purpose of this lecture. It was an acute chondral injury. I showed you all those flaps, but sometimes it can be complete detachment. So this was actually a, an acute chondral injury of the humeral head on a patient after a second anterior dislocation. And you can see here on the surgical image, the clean cut defect with straight margins in the, in the posterior supramedial aspect of the humeral head. And you can see here the banker, the torn anterior labrum. And you can see here the defect with the clean margins. And then as I go more inferiorly, you can see the defect there and the displace of tissue banker. And there you go, the uh, chondral fragment matching the donor site in the humeral head. So occasionally, these chondral flaps can completely detach and shred off, and you need to look for them on your, on, on your joint recesses. The heel sacs, we already talk about it. The evolution of the concept from an inverted pair that Dr. Berger described earlier into the engaging and disengaging heel sex lesion. Here you have an example of a very deep one. More important sometimes than the size and the depth is really the location, location, location of these lesions and their relationship with the footprint of the rotator cuff and if they're on track or off track with respect to the, the track on the humeral head. So uh, this is from Stoller's book again, Dr. Beltran showing us the engaging uh, hill sacs lesion. And here I show you this Aber image uh, before on a routine MRI, you can see how the heel sacs is almost engaging into the, into the anterior inferior glenoid rim. So you can imagine that in addition to the heel sacs, you have bipolar bone loss with a bony banker, then the chances that you have an engaging heel sacs uh, lesion increases. And that's kind of the rational behind the theory of the on-track, off-track phenomenon that was uh, developed uh, subsequently by Dr. Giacomo and Dr. Itoi, as well as Dr. Barnhart. So you see here, you have the normal appearance. Here you have your heel sacs, as well as a body banker. So there is a number of calculations that you will have to do that I don't have time to uh, discuss in depth, but you do those to determine if the heel sacs lesion is on track or off track, and that certainly correlates with the degree of instability. This article from AJR from uh, Soterius Geftopoulos at NYU is a very nice article that I recommend that you, that you read. They teach you how to do different measurements in terms of the length, the width, and the depth of the hill sex lesion, as well as some angles that you can uh, measure. And certainly the hill sex lesions that are more unlikely oriented versus vertically oriented have greater chance to be of the engaging type because when you go into abduction, they become parallel by virtue of their obliquity. They become parallel to the axis of the glenoid and they can engage. So that's different than the more vertical ones that uh, when you go on abduction, they're not parallel to the axis of the glenoid. So another piece uh, in the puzzle to, to consider, here you have one that is more obliquely oriented and one that is more vertically oriented. And these are 3D reconstructions from Dr. Fernando Re Santiago on an article from 2017 showing us how these uh, obliquely oriented uh, heel sex lesions have greater risk of engaging 
versus the more vertically oriented ones. So uh, on that same article from AJR, the NYU group talk about the Glenwood track theory, but I certainly have to give props to the organizers of this, of this event, which is the, the MSK division at Emory. And there's this beautiful review article on the sketch of radiology published at the end of 2017. So now it's like uh, a little bit over two years old, but it's an excellent article with Dr. Singer Adam here, the senior author, but you can see Felix, Monica, and the other members of the of the MSK division at Emory, as well as the research associate job. And I recommend that you read this article for assessment of bipolar bone injury. And now the last uh, 15 minutes, we're gonna talk about posterior instability. Common causes include posterior dislocations, a redundant posterior capsule, and posterior capsular label ligamentous stairs. You can see these more often in athletes with repetitive over the head motion, uh, such as weightlifters, pitchers, uh, racket sport athletes, football players, swimmers, uh, volleyball players. Anyway, they are at risk for posterior subluxation. And uh, some of the injuries that I'm gonna show you, do we do see more frequently in athletes. We can use the same criteria that we discussed in anterior instability in terms of frequency, if it's a single or a repetitive uh, uh, event, uh, if it's uh, a subluxation or a dislocation, if it's unidirectional, multidirectional. Remember that for multi or bidirectional, you have to have a posterior uh, component. Um, and if it's traumatic or a traumatic. So here is a case courtesy of Adrian. This is one of my body, an MSK radiologist from Mexico, from Culiacan, and he sent me this very nice uh, acute uh, dislocation. And you can see the humeral head is dislocated posteriorly, and you have the labrum here knocked off uh, here on the on the back. So with all that soft tissue edema, uh, this is a more chronic case uh, from our institution. You can see the bony remodeling not only on the humeral head but on the glenoid with on a patient that was fixed on posterior uh, subluxation and the X-ray and the CT correlation there. So um, the same injuries that we saw anteriorly, we can see posteriorly, whether it's a glenoid failure, a humular failure, a failure on both sides. So for the glenoid, uh, the posterior counterparts for the anterior glenoid instability lesions, for the banker lesion, you can have a posterior or reverse banker. For the ALPSA, the anterior labral periosteal sleep avulsion, you can have a posterior labral periosteal sleep avulsion. You can have very similarly to a parathesis lesion, you can have a chemo lesion, which can be occult uh, on, on, on routine MR. If you have an ellipsa, uh, theoretically, you can have a polypsa, a posterior ligamentous sleep avulsion with a normal labrum. And if you have complete glenoid detachment of the anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament, you can have a posterior or reverse gaggle as there is glenoid avulsion of the posterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament. If you, have, if you have a Hegel or a B Hegel, you can have the posterior counterparts, whether you put a P or an R for a posterior Hegel or a reverse Hegel and a posterior bony Hegel. So you can see all these acronyms can become very difficult. The idea is not for you to memorize any of these. What I teach the residents and fellows is to just be very descriptive on your, on your reports because not uh, the majority of orthopods will be very familiar with this terminology, but not other, other, other people that may send the patients to you may not be familiar with that. So be very descriptive. Anterior floating AGHL, posterior uh, band of the inferior glenoid humeral ligament being floating. If you have a combination of both uh, failure of the humeral and glenoid side. And if you have a heel sex, you can have a reverse heel sex or you can have the posterior counterparts of all the uh, glenoid label uh, injuries, the posterior glad, posterior glad, posterior glad. And you can have some slab tears that are associated with posterior or multidirectional instability, such as a slab eight with extension along the entire posterior labrum or a nine when you have the, the circumferential label tearing. Towards the end, we're, I'm gonna show you a couple of examples of abandoned lesions. So, Starting with the banker, with the reverse banker, the diagram from this skeletal radiology article, and this nice case courtesy of uh, Roar again from Norway, uh, showing the posterior dislocation, the reverse heel sac, 
entrapped anterior capsule, inferior glenohumeral ligament, and they reverse uh, the posterior soft tissue banker. And this case, courtesy of Benoit from Switzerland, Dr. Riz, showing very nicely the, the reverse hill sack, the reverse banker, and a very nice reverse hill sacks with the bone marrow edema, more acute case. This is more chronic, a gradient echo, courtesy of Dr. Jimenez, one of my mentors from LSU, showing a reverse banker uh, fracture here uh, on a patient with posterior instability. And this is one of our patients on a 3D showing the posterior label third that end up being completely detached at some levels. And you can see it here on the ABER images. Note please that the humeral head is well positioned. The center, the isocenter of the humeral head is well positioned with respect to the glenoid on the root in axial, as well as on ABER. But um, sometimes you can do something called fader, which is flexion, adduction, internal rotation, which is similar to ABER. But you, what you do is you put attention not on the anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament, as you do with abduction external rotation, but with this one, you put tension on the posterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament. So a posterior labral tear that may be more difficult to see on the, on the routine MR images obtaining the different orthogonal planes, it can become uh, more evident on the provocative images obtained with fader, flexion, adduction, internal rotation. And this is, I only do these ones very occasionally in patients that I know beforehand that they, they uh, have posterior or multidirectional instability. And this is how you position the patient and the coil, and you do the acquisition, and this is fader, flexion, adduction, internal rotation. And this article from Dr. Kevaras on Skeletal Radiology 2010, uh, giving us a preliminary experience on the use of this particular uh, sequence of fader in patients with uh, posterior inferior label tears. So there you go, uh, a nice example. And notice that when you go on fader, you can see this particular patient that had posterior instability as the humeral head translated posteriorly with respect to the center of the glenoid, which we didn't see on the non-provocative axial images. Another patient here, with a posterior banker, almost looked at, like a pulsa, but it was it was completely detached. So it was a reverse banker. And you can see scarring of the anterior supporting the structures. And there was a reverse heel sex and the completely detached posterior labrum uh, with some uh, scarring tissue. Here, a reverse heel sex, again, uh, in the anteromedial aspect of the humeral head, in contradistinction to the posterolateral normal heel sex. So this is a McLaughlin's uh, fracture or, or reverse heel sex, right? What you will see as a trough on, on the x-rays. And here you have the bone marrow edema and the tear of the posterior labrum, which was partial in some levels, but completely detached with a strip periosteum that it was detached. So by definition, a posterior banker uh, in this particular case. And you can see on the sagittal images that it was completely uh, detached. And uh, here is a different case with uh, another reverse uh, banker and complete detachment. This one with not only soft tissue posterior banker, but a posterior bony fracture there for a bony, a reverse bony fragment, bony fragment a banker, a reverse banker fracture. So here you have the ABER of that case. Again, good alignment on the non provocative routine axial as well as on the provocative ABER, it is well positioned. You can see uh, the bony fragment of the axillary radiograph. This one is a nice one. It was a more chronic reverse banker with a piece of bone detached and synovialized there now, and the labrum being uh, completely torn, the posterior labrum. And you can see that on the axial images, the humeral head was slightly displaced uh, posteriorly, but look where the humeral head went with ABER. So putting tension anteriorly, even with that positioning, the humeral head went posteriorly. So this is gross instability demonstrated on MR. And you can see the, the posterior uh, banker lesion, and you can imagine that, uh, look what happened. The patient agreed to go into fader and he almost dislocated. You see where the humeral head, with respect to the glenoid, you can certainly see the, the posterior label lesion again. But he was almost dislocated. And he was 
he was like, oh yeah, do it. And my shoulder goes out all the time and it doesn't hurt. So I was talking to him and he graciously agreed to do this. So for more subtle cases, you can certainly see uh, that, uh, that degree of, of abnormal translation on MR. And here the, MR, the correlation for the bony fragment of the reverse vector fracture, the axillary view. And this is and this is another one that is more more displaced. And you can see that if you put the golf ball and if you have that fracture from the T golf, your ball is going to fall. And that's the reverse banker and the CT uh, demonstration and the 3D reconstruction for the percentage of bone loss. Pulp solutions, posterior labral periosteal slip avulsion. This is the strip of periosteum, but it is still attached. So similar to the alpha, but posteriorly. That's the diagram from the Skeletal Radiology article. And you can see this nice case with this strip of periosteum, but still attached. Here you have another one, and you can see very nicely the, the periosteal strip, but still attached in contradistinction to several of the completely detached uh, reverse bankers that I show you. And here you have very nicely strip uh, periosteum, but from, uh, still attached here, almost the entire posterior thing was straight, but it remained attached to the glenoid as we saw on that beautiful sagittal. And here's the Kim lesion, which is very difficult to see sometimes. They can be certainly hidden or concealed at time of, of arthroscopy. It is an intrasubstance tear of the posterior inferior labrum. There may be some stripping of the posterior glenoid margin. They can be associated uh, fissure or along the condolable junction posteriorly. Dr. Kim described on arthroscopy four subtypes that we're not going to get into, but the clinical significance for this lesion, for this Kim's lesion, is that the surgeon may need to convert this otherwise concealed or incomplete posterior inferior label tear into a complete tear to be able to repair it uh, together with the posterior band of the inferior lateral humeral ligament, because failure to do that may result in persistent posterior instability. And this was from Dr. Kim's article. You can see with the repeated repetitive posterior translation, you can see how you end up having that intrasubstance there of the posterior labrum and you can have superficial chondral erosions as well. So here's a case in point. You see the intrasubstance there of the posterior inferior labrum only able to sit on three cuts. And that was it. How about this one on an MR arthrogram, a reverse heel sac, a reverse heel sac, with a very subtle, non-displaced and incomplete intersubstance there in the posterior inferior labrum. Only see it on the T2, not that much on the T1. And this other one on a patient, on an arthrogram, you can see on a, the routine axials, uh, it shows there on the T1, you cannot see it well, but on the routine axial T2, you see a little bit better the fluid from the intersubstance there. And there you see it in two cuts. And this particular patient went into a fader, flexion, induction, internal rotation with the arm underneath the contralateral cheek. And uh, you can see here the, the came lesion that is slightly better appreciated as tension was placed on that posterior band of the inferior lateral humeral ligament. So similar to a parenthesis uh, that it gets better seen with Aber, you can have these team lesions that can be better seen with fader, uh, FADIR in patients with posterior instability. Uh, one last one, this one with a fissure along the condolable junction for a type 3 team lesion and uh, the correlation on ABER that shows a little bit better the, the separation when you compare with the straight axials. This one was a more chronic one, almost evolving now into, into, into a Bennett lesion with a piece of bone and the chondrolabral fissure and the superficial tear of the posterior uh, labrum. And that's how it looked on the straight non-provocative uh, axial and how it looked on, on fader. Again, look at the posterior translation, in this case, on a patient with posterior instability and look how separated that uh, Kim lesion becomes when you put attention on that posterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament. The P. Gagel is a posterior glenoid failure of the glenohumeral ligament. That's the diagram. The glenoid failure occurs, the failure occurs at the glenoid side. 
So here you have your posterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament. And look, it's completely torn from the glenoid insertion, but the labrum is intact. So this is a beautiful case, axial images of a P gaggle or a reverse gaggle, okay? Labrum intact, but the failure is at the glenoid side of the posterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament. Here you have a posterior hagel. The failure was not at the glenoid side, but at the humeral side. So here the glenoid insertion is intact, but the failure was at the, at the humeral insertion of the posterior band of this inferior glenohumeral ligament that is torn and retracted there. And you can see here on this uh, MR arthrogram, the contrast in that classic pattern leaking along the posterior edge of the capsule and uh, tracking along the medial cortex of the, the posterior medial cortex of the proximal humerus and the health sac lesion. So that's different than the other patterns of leakage of conscious that we saw before. And here you have a case, not an arthrogram, but a patient that came with a routine MRI. And you can see that the glenoid insertion is fine, but the humeral insertion of that posterior band on the PD and on the T2 fat set shows the soft tissue edema and the failure at the humeral insertion site for a reverse uh, Hegel, okay? This is a case for courtesy of Lena Chen and Don Resley that was actually, we saw this case on 2009 when I finished on the last month of my fellowship. And it was a patient with a posterior or reverse bankard. And you can see here the bony avulsion for the posterior band of the uh, inferior glenohumeral ligament at the humeral insertion site. So it was a reverse bony Hegel or a PB Hegel also with a reverse bankard. And this case was subsequently published on the Journal of Shoulder and Elbow Surgery that same year on 2009. These are the CT images showing the bony avulsion at the humeral insertion site of the posterior band and the bony avulsion at the glenoid insertion site of that posterior band. So it was kind of a floating posterior band, if you will. Uh, I'll show you another floating posterior band. This one actually with a bony, a reverse bony band card and the glenoid failure of the posterior band at the humeral insertion site, excuse me of that posterior band. So the posterior band is floating because it fell at the glenoid insertion site by virtue of a reverse band card and at the humeral insertion site by virtue of a reverse halo. And uh, there is a classification system for these floating posterior bands, whether it's a pure soft tissue avulsion on both sides or soft tissue on one side and bony on the other side, or bony avulsion on both sides. So there's a classification system for that. And here is the reference on JDJS from Dr. Millet's article. And the same way as we can have the GLAD lesions, we can have posterior GLADs. So here, uh, case in point, you have a full thickness chondral defect with a tear extending along the chondral label junction and an area of delamination along the posterior glenoid rim. So this was a posterior or reverse GLAD. You can see on the coronal images, the subchondral uh, cyst formation and bone marrow edema in the posterior inferior glenoid. And here on ABER, you can see the full thickness chondral defect and the subchondral cyst formation on the posterior inferior glenoid. And on this sagittal image, you can see the strip of the periosteum. So you can have a constellation of all those findings there. And this is a more chronic uh, posterior glad, almost going into a Bennett already with ossification or uh, calcification at the uh, glenoid insertion site of that posterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament, but with an associated chondrolable injury there. This one was a little flap in situ, not displaced, so it's a posterior glab, a posterior glenoid labral articular flap with a full thickness fissure and a component of delamination, but no flipping out to talk uh, of a glat but I will show you posterior glats or posterior glenoid labral articular teardrop. So this was uh, the one of the anterior glats that I show you, right? This is anterior morphology, anterior aspect of the axillary recess and the anterior donor side. That's in contradistinction to this. This, we are here in the anterior aspect of the axillary pouch is normal. And as I go posteriorly, I see the, the teardrop so this is a reverse or posterior glad lesion. 
You can see the anatomy here is the infra and the spinal genic. This is posterior glenoid and posterior aspect of the axillary recess. And the donor side was posterior. So this is a posterior glut, okay? So here you have an, an, a posterior glut. Look at the morphology of the glenoid, spinal glenoid notch, posterior cuff. This is an anterior glut. Suprascapular notch, anterior morphology of the glenoid, anterior cuff, anterior aspect of the axillary recess, posterior aspect of the axillary recess for an anterior and posterior glats, donor side anterior, donor side posterior. Okay, so that's that. Guard lesion is like a more severe uh, glut with subfrontal cyst formation, carolash loss, and degeneration along that posterior labrum. So uh, posterior glenoid, so you can see the tremendous involvement here. And it's posterior. You can see on the sagittal images that the majority of the involvement is uh, posterior inferiorly in this patient with the chronic posterior instability, as you can nicely see here on the sagittal uh, images. And the Bennett, I showed you an example already, but here with CT, that's the so-called thrower's exostosis. I kind of use this Bennett lesion acronym mainly for athletes and particularly for pitchers or throwers when I see this finding, but there's overlapping. I can see stripping of periosteum and exostotic like pulps or lesions that look like Bennett's. So I will use the term Bennett if I have the proper clinical history. And this has been designated as a thrower's exostosis as well. This case from the literature from my packs showing a very thick uh, uh, posterior labrum on a patient with glenoid internal rotation deficit, posterior capsule, and then an exostosis or calcification at the insertion site of that posterior band of the inferior glenoid humor ligament. And uh, that's that glenoid internal rotation deficit is again on these throwers, baseball pitchers, um, is, is one of the, uh, is one of the, uh, effects that occur in the cascade of events in patients with, with uh, a dead arm syndrome early on, you can have this shifting of the contact point uh, between the humeral head and the glenoid as, as the pitchers get into this zone, but they go into this zone, they, they, get, they, they really get a, a glenoid internal rotation deficit. And that is caused by the repetitive throwing motion occurring mainly during the late talking and early acceleration phase. Uh, what you will see on MRI is a thickening of the posterior capsule, posterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament and the posterior labrum. So I'll show you a, a couple of examples of, of that and, uh, and you will see uh, what we're talking about. So here you can already see that there is all this extra tissue or thickening of the posterior, posterior inferior glenoid and capsule and the cycle image. And as I go on the axials and I start below the level of the equator there, you see that that posterior labrum is, is thick and the posterior capsule. So it's a patient with compensatory changes from glenoid internal rotation deficit. Look at the whole thing here. So that was that case and here another one, not as impressive, but also thickening of the posterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament and thickening of the posterior capsule label complex. So that's GERD. The reverse heel sex is also, CT plays a role. You can nicely demonstrate those uh, on the 3D reconstructions. Here you have an axial CT and MR of a mildly impacted heel sex lesion in the inframedial aspect of the humeral head. And here on the CT of a trough sign on the sagittal images, you can see the trough as we scan through that area. This is one of my colleagues who gave me permission to use his, uh, his shoulder in this case. He's one of our, uh, he works in our institution and he has posterior, well, actually now he has multi-directional instability, but he had posterior instability for several years. And this was the reverse uh, uh, banker. And this is the reverse heel sac with a chronic torn anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament, which is invaginated in there. Remember the, the circle concept. So this is him. And this was a follow-up MR arthrogram that we did on him a few years later. And this is almost on either, and excuse me, on fader. And you can see that the label there is now more extensive and the, hills, the reverse heel size is almost engaging 
So he's going to have surgery and stabilization procedure. And the same way as we had algorithms for uh, determining treatments depending on the percentage of bone loss for the lenoid, um, you can have uh, algorithms uh, that depending on the percentage of bone loss for a reverse uh, heel sacs, you can decide what, uh, what kind of treatment uh, the orthopod will offer to the patient going from conservative stuff to allograft and arthroplasties. So those go from the normal reemplacement procedures that you will see in anterior instability to something like this, which is a, modifla, a modified McLaughlin's, which is uh, instead of tugging the, the infraspinatus into a normal heel sac, here you are tugging the subscapularis into a reverse heel sac, and in this particular case, also with an allograft to try to fill up all that posterior leno, posterior heel sacs because they, they can be of the engaging type as well. And there are characteristics that we can see on this reverse heel sex, reverse heel sex lesion to determine if they are engaging or disengaging type, measuring different angles. Here's the article for you to, to read about. And there is this nice review from the American Journal of Sports Medicine uh, talking about the risk of engagement in patients with bipolar bone loss. So not only the reverse heel sacs, uh, but a reverse banker and how that can increase your, your uh, risk of engagement if you have bipolar bone loss. And they do talk about the, these angles and how you do the measurements. And if the, if the gamma angle is less than 90 degrees, that's, us that's usually an unengaging reverse uh, heel sac. But if it's more than 90 degrees, and you can add about two grades per millimeter of the length of the defect, uh, that will return, uh, that will result in an engaging reverse heel sac. So I purposely left all the explanation of the measurements there. So when you review this lecture uh, on demand online, you can, you can review the entire concept again. Multidirectional instability, I'm just going to show you a couple of cases and we are gonna be done. Uh, this is normal anatomy, and this is a lazy J form or a delta form with hypoplasia of the posterior lenoid. And uh, here, let me show you this case, a very uh, short and vertically oriented uh, the hypoplastic or dysplastic coracoid process. And you can see the deficiency of the posterior lenoid with compensatory hypertrophy of that posterior labrum, which in addition is torn in this particular case. Here is a different case. Look at the morphology of that coracoid. I'm normally short and vertically pointing up. So another patient with a dysplastic uh, uh, glenoid with hypoplasia of the posterior glenoid rim and a posterior label there with posterior paralabal cyst formation. And uh, this patient actually came back a few years later and we did a, an MR arthrogram. And now he pretty much developed a circumferential like a, like a slab type 10, a circumferential label there. None of this was present before. It was just posterior, but now the entire labrum is torn in a near circumferential fashion as the patient uh, develop a multidirectional instability and the humeral head was going out in all directions. Classic dentate appearance on radiograph, the so-called dentate glenoid of an hypoplastic uh, glenoid. Uh, sometimes they can be uh, bilateral, and this is the last case I'm going to leave you, Dr. Um, William Palmer from NGH graciously gave me this case recently because I lost the entire talk. So uh, he sent me this nice one of his on a 27 year old with multidirectional instability. And um, not all multidirectional instability patients have a hypoplastic glenoid. This is a patient with a normal glenoid but as you see on the axial images, there is a posterior label tear, but here uh, anteriorly you have a strip of periosteum and here you have a, the strip periosteum going anterior inferiorly and the tear goes all the way down to the six o'clock position. So it's an extensive label tear, but there is a stripping of the periosteum anteriorly and to a lesser extent posteriorly. But when you go to Aber, uh, this has to be one of the most beautiful birthdays lesions that you'll ever seen.
as uh, Bill likes to say on his lecture about instability. So thank you, uh, Dr. Palmer, for the courtesy of, of sharing this case with us. And uh, in summary, we talked about a ton of control of capsular level ligamentous injuries. We talk about anterior ones, glenoid failure, humeral failure, both sides, and we talk about the posterior counterparts. No being more, these are my references. I thank you all for your attention. And this is um, a special thanks that I want to give to Dr. Skalski from, from, for all his di not, uh, diagrams. And uh, you, I suggest you that you follow Matt on Instagram and on Twitter as he shares some of his beautiful diagrams frequently. And this is his, his website. Uh, I want to thank also several of my friends around the world that gave me some courtesy cases for this lecture, um, particularly the MSK division at UCSD. This is where I did my fellowship with Don Resnick and Mini Pastor, Christine Chung, Tudor, all of them. This is home for me, very close to my heart. And the people at the MSK division at UVMMC at the University of Vermont Medical Center where I, where I, where I work. So if you have any questions, we run out of time, you can send me an email. This is my work email. This, at this time, we were victims of a cyber attack. So you may not get through this email. If you get the email bounce back, just send it to my personal email address that is here with Hotmail and I will answer your questions. I thank you all for your attention.